Hey guys, this week's lecture, this topic, is going to be on interest groups. History of interest groups in America, interest groups, good or bad, the functions of interest groups, interest group resources, interest group tactics. Guys, study review the lecture, but also review the PowerPoints. There are a lot of test questions off the PowerPoints. Or if not a lot, there's at least some test questions off the PowerPoint. So interest groups. An interest group is simply a group of people who share some political goals and they try to influence public policy decisions. Does this sound like anything else that we've talked about? It should. It should sound like political parties. What is the difference between a political party and an interest group? The political party, they want to get their people elected to important government positions or elected positions and control government. They want to control everything. Interest groups, on the other hand, they only really care about a few things, one, maybe two things. They don't want to control everything. They want to have influence over one particular area. That is their concern. Types of interest groups, let's just bring them all up at once. We can go through these slowly. We see that there are various types of interest groups. The first, business or trade and trade associations. These are interest groups that are formed by merchants, creditors, business owners, and other commerce related organization. Their goal is to promote business interest. Examples of business related interest groups include the National Association of Manufacturers, or NAM. Another one would be the Chamber of Commerce of the United States. Please understand, interest groups represent both large and small business interests. They're going to represent both large and small groups. If we're talking about trade associations, this would be something like the American Trucking Association or the American Bankers Association. Labor unions. A labor union is an organization of workers who share the same type of job or who work in the same industry. Labor unions will press the government for policies that will benefit their members. So labor unions represent people who work in these jo types of jobs. When we're thinking labor unions, we're usually thinking blue collar job, electrician, welder, plumber, carpenter, something like that. Usually labor unions were thinking blue collar workers. The largest in both size and political power is the American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Organizations. The American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Organizations, the AFL-CIO. And I have their seal up here, upper right hand. Organized labor generally speaks with one voice on such social welfare and job related matters like social security programs, minimum wages, unemployment, job safety, workplace safety, that kind of thing. Professional associations. 
The professions are generally defined as those occupations that require extensive and specialized training. This could be medicine, law, teaching. Which group represents doctors? Which professional association represents doctors? The AMA, the American Medical Association. How do you know this? Well, because I have that seal right here, middle left. So AMA for dentist, American Dental Association, the ADA. Who represents attorneys, lawyers? The ABA, the American Bar Association. For teachers, it's the National Education Association, the NEA. Farm groups is another type. Farm groups or agricultural groups. These are interest groups that look after the interest of farmer and they monitor the government's agricultural policies. Once again, representation can be large farms, large ranches, small farms, small ranches. What I mean by this is they can represent several broad-based farm groups are groups that raise a number of commodities. If you're talking meat, it could be you know, pork, so it could be hogs, cattle for beef, chicken, whatnot. If you're talking just you know crops, corn, soy, wheat, hay, whatnot. So we have all these these farmers or these ranches they'll be represented, these groups represent the ones that grow multiple types of crops, they raise multiple types of animals, but they also represent the single, the single grower. You know, they represent a farm that only grows corn, that only grows wheat. But once again, they represent any farm or agri agricultural type of business. The most prominent farm groups are the National Grange, the American Farm Bureau Federation, and lastly, the National Farmers Union. Racial and ethnic minority groups. Racial and ethnic minority groups exist to represent a certain racial or ethnic segment of the population. This could be the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. This group represents, exists to represent African Americans. Could be LULAC, League of United Latin American Citizens. It could be La Raza, L-A, then second word, R-A-Z-A. Could be MALDEF. M-A-L-D-E-F, Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. These last three groups exist to help Hispanics, but these racial or ethnic minority groups exist to help a certain racial or ethnic minority of the population. Religious groups. Religious groups try to influence public policy in regards to religious matters. Examples of these groups would include the National Council of Churches, the Christian Coalition, the National Catholic Welfare Council, the American Jewish Congress, the Anti-Defamation League. They want to have some influence on what the government does in regards to religion. The last group, citizen, advocacy, cause groups. We can actually break these up. Let's do citizen groups first. Citizen group, and we're gonna see some 
some overlap here. We're going to see some double dipping. Citizen groups exist to help a certain segment of the population. Does that sound familiar? Have you heard me say help an existing segment of the population before? Yeah, you did a few minutes ago. Racial and ethnic minority groups. What is the difference between citizen groups and racial and ethnic minority groups? Racial and ethnic minority groups is limited. Its membership is limited to that race or ethnicity. Hence the NAACP, hence La Raza, MALDEF, NAACP only exists for remote African American interest. LULAC, MALDEF, La Raza exist to, to forward or put forth Hispanic interest. These citizen groups, they still, ex they still exist to represent, to help certain segments of the population but race or ethnicity is not a requirement for these groups. So examples of this would be the American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars. You have to be a vet. Race or ethnicity is not an issue in here. They don't care. You have to be a vet. Another example would be AARP. The American Association of Retired Persons. You have to be 50. I believe it's 50. 50 sounds right. Do they care about race or ethnicity? No. All they care about is minimum age. So that's the difference. We do see some double dipping. NAACP, LULAC, etc. could be considered citizen. But the difference between citizen and racial or ethnic minority, citizen groups don't care about race or ethnicity. Let's do cause groups next because advocacy is going to take me a few minutes. Cause groups. Cause groups exist to promote or oppose a certain cause. Examples of these. The American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. Their purpose is to make sure that everybody's civil liberties are protected. The League of Women Voters, the National Women's Political Caucus, their cause is to make sure women are represented, women have a say in politics. The National Wildlife Federation, the Sierra Club, their cause is what? Animals, wildlife. Yes, PETA, if I said animals, we could say PETA, P-E-T-A, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Hey, this is Texas. Most of you are in Texas taking this class. You might be in some other state. Man, in Texas, what do we love? Texans love what? Yes, we love alcohol, but what else do we love? We love guns. We love firearms. What interest group exists to protect the Second Amendment? Well, they say they exist for, to promote or protect the Second Amendment. Yeah, the NRA, the National Rifle Association. I've been giving examples of groups that promote causes. They work to causes. But remember how I said they could also oppose causes. These two group, groups, by definition, what they support means that they actually oppose each other. These two groups, the first one, the National Right to Life Committee. Right to Life, they are against abortion. They are a pro-life group. Who would their opposite be? It would be Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood, their cause is pro-choice. They believe abortion should be legal, it should be safe, it, they believe it should be the woman's choice. So Planned Parenthood, woman's choice, pro-choice, right to life, pro-life, should not be an abortion in most cases. See, these two have fundamentally different goals, and in their existence, they oppose each other. 
last one. Let's talk about advocacy groups. Advocacy groups different or differ, excuse me, from every other group mentioned. Every other group mentioned exists to only help. They exist to only serve their members. Advocacy groups, they exist to help everybody, whether you're a member or not. They don't care. They're still going to help you. What if you don't want their help? See my, they don't care. They're still going to help you. An example of this came in the late 60s, 1960s, and we still benefit from today. And this was the installation of seat belts in a vehicle. Public citizen was concerned we were having a number of people die in vehicle accidents. Public citizen was another advocacy group. So they petitioned, they told the federal government, hey, we're having people die unnecessarily. Why don't you put seat belts in, in these vehicles? Why don't you make it a requirement to reduce wasted lives, to reduce unnecessary loss of life? So the government said, okay, that's fine, not a problem. And we have a federal regulation requiring safety restraints, requiring seat belts. Did everybody want them? No. Was everybody a member of Public Citizen? No. But does everybody benefit from having these safety restraints? Yes, they do save a number of lives. So we have benefited, whether we wanted to or not. There's actually a term for those people, for us who, who benefit from something that who benefit from a causes from a group's work that we are not a member. And that term is free, F-R-E-E, -E, rider, R-I-D-E-R. -E we are a free rider. Free rider simply means we are benefiting from a group's work, from a group's effort without giving anything in exchange, without donating time money, effort, anything like that. We are free riders. So even today, even though we weren't born, most of us weren't born back then, we would still be considered a free rider from this group's work in regards to safety restraints, safety harnesses. So the advocacy group, they represent everybody. Interest groups, good or bad? Depends. Start off talking about Alexis de Tocqueville. He was a French political theorist. Once the United States wins its independence and we start our own country, we start this new form of government, this democracy, De Tocqueville comes over from France. He has too much time and he has too much money. So he comes over from, Sprint, from France and spends a couple of years touring the new, newly born United States of America, taking notes. He wants to observe this democracy. He goes back to France and writes this book called Democracy in America. According to to Tocqueville, these interest groups, and actually back then we, we had a different name for them. It's the same thing, but it's a different name. Back then we called them factions. De Tocqueville believes that these different factions are good, that this is an indication of a strong democratic culture. Factions are good. These interest groups are good because people like-minded people can band together and press the government, give the government their ideas. So de Tocqueville thought they were good, strong democratic culture. James Madison, on the other hand, one of the Federalists, 
Madison is often referred to as the father of the Constitution. Madison and Federalist number 10, he warns about the dangers of factions. He fears this tyranny of the majority. We talked about that early on. So he doesn't like the idea of factions. He doesn't like the idea of interest groups. But he's torn. He's stuck because he understands that Americans, we have certain freedoms, the right to assemble. So we need to have the right to join these groups, to, ju to create this majority. By outlawing this, this is a suppression of our freedom of assembly. And Madison does not want to suppress our freedoms. So he doesn't like factions, he doesn't like interest groups, but he, he doesn't want to suppress our freedoms. What he finally decides, how he comes to grip with these, with this idea, finally says factions or, or these interest groups, they'll actually be okay because these factions will check each other. So what he's thinking is that these will be cause groups. For every faction that exists out there that wants something, there's going to be a faction out there that wants the opposite, that's going to oppose. Faction A is going to oppose faction B. So you know, his final thought is, yeah, okay. Factions are okay because they will oppose each other. They will cancel each other out. Functions of interest group. Some of these we can put together. Representation and participation can go together. Functions of interest groups, they represent citizens, they represent businesses, participation, it, it, it acts as another way for citizens to influence government. It's another voice to be heard. We, if we are over 50, if we are retired, we can call our, our representative, we can call our senator, our interest groups, in this case AARP, they can also contact these elected officials to say what they want strength in numbers, and we'll talk about that again in a second. Education. <clears throat> I have this saying, knowing indicates caring. What I mean by that is, if I don't know, I don't care. If I don't know there's a problem, I don't care that there's a problem because I have no knowledge of it. If I don't know about it, I can't care about it. This is what interest groups are trying to avoid. And what I mean by that is they are trying to educate. An interest group will look around and they will identify what they perceive to be as a problem. Okay, this is a problem, we got to fix it. Well, first thing we these interest groups have to do is they have to educate their members. They have to explain to their members why this is a problem. Once we educate members, we're going to move on. Once we get all of our members on the same page, and we're going to try to educate public. Why are we going to try to educate the public? A couple of different reasons. A, maybe they'll join our group, strength in numbers. But B, we're also going to try and shape public opinion about this issue. Once we have educated our members, once we have educated the public, it becomes a matter of public opinion. Enough people care about it that the government starts to take notice our group is going to educate the government on this issue, on this problem. This is a problem. These, this is a, a solution. So we're going to educate members, public, and government. The public, we the people, 
do we like interest groups? Do we like these factions educating the government? Pros and cons. Think of it this way. If you take medicine, if you take pills, if you take vitamins, how do you know these pills, this medicine that you take are safe to take? Well, the Food and Drug Administration has approved them. The pharmaceutical companies have gone had to go through a number of clinical trials to prove that your the medicine that they're offering, the pills they're offering, are safe for human, or relatively safe anyway, for human consumption. This is called research and development. Research and development. Expensive are inexpensive. Expensive or cheap. Research and development is the most expensive th item in bringing anything to the market. Research and development. This sounds like a tangent, and I understand that, but let me explain. Why would we like this interest group, this faction, to educate the government? Texas. We are facing a natural resource, resource shortage. Did y'all know that? This, this is true. They're saying by around 2050, Texas is going to run out of water. We're not going to have enough water for all residents. So the interest group, the faction, they're going to identify the problem. The problem is lack of this natural resource. We're going to run out of water. We want our members to be concerned. Why? Because we need water to survive. That's why members are going to be concerned. Once we get our members into it, involved, we're going to let the public know. Should the public know? Should the public be concerned? Public needs water also. So once enough members of the public become concerned, and this becomes a matter of public opinion, we can go up to the Texas legislature and say, look, the people are concerned. We're going to run out of water. We're not going to have enough of this natural resource. However, we have come up with a plan to fix it. And this plan, this is not a real plan. I am just making this up. This is just an example. But we may have this interest group, this faction come up and say, look, we're going to run out of water by 2050. If we start now, if we start building, if we start creating man-made lakes in Texas in spot A, B, C, D, E, and F, pick spots around Texas, I don't care. If we start creating these man-made lakes now, we are able to finish them within the next six years. According to historical rainfall, by 2045, however long, these lakes will be at or near capacity, and these man-made lakes can now provide water to the surrounding towns, to the surrounding areas. We have solved a problem. Do we, the people, why would we, the people, like these interest groups, these, fraction, these factions, educating government? They, the reason we like it is they have already done the research and development. They've already paid the money to research it, to come up with a solution. How come we may we the people, we the public, may not like interest groups, we may not like factions educating the government. Well, tr this is true that they came up, these interest groups, these factions, came up with a solution. A solution. Just because they came up with a solution doesn't necessarily mean it is the best solution. So they might find a solution that hits the parameters, that hits what they care about, and it's the best for them, so they're going to pitch this idea. That doesn't necessarily mean 
it's the best for everybody. So that's education. Agenda building, program monitoring, put these together. Agenda building, they're just going to highlight problems or issues that are existence in the various areas, you know, agricultural policy, educational policy, whatever. Program monitoring, we're going to watch what the government's doing. Is the government giving subsidies to agricultural institutions? Are they giving government money for farms to grow certain crops, to grow corn or to grow soybean or something like that? So agenda building, program monitoring go together. Interest group resources. Members. An interest group, they want to have a large politically active membership. They want large politically active membership. Hold on to that thought for a second and let me go to lobbyist real quick. I'm going to put these two together. Lobbyist. A lobbyist is simply a paid advocate for a group. They're going to go speak directly to our, our representatives. This is their job. This is what we pay them for. Now, let's, get, let's put these two together, lobbyists, interest groups, and members. Hi, my name is Mike. How are you today, Senator? How are you today, Senator Doe? I'm sorry to bother you, but I represent, oh, I don't know, some interest group. What, what? The Citizens for Concerned Koalas. I have no idea, I just made up something. I'm here to speak to you about the care that koalas are receiving in America. Senator, you need to listen to me. The group I represent, Better Care for Koalas. Man, we have 10,000 members. 500 of them voted in the last election. Does Senator Doe or whoever I'm talking to now care? If I say I have 10,000 members, that sounds impressive. If only five of, 500 of them voted? I just lost the senator's interest. How come? They don't have to listen. There, there is real, no real downside. But with this large politically active membership, I represent the Koala Care Group, 10,000 members, 9,800, 9,800, 98 percent of us voted in the last election. The elected official is now going to listen to me. Yes, they are. You have to have a large enough group membership and they have to be politically active so that if, for lack of a better term, if you make a threat, you say, hey, we will not vote for you. We will not support you. It has to mean something. You have to be able to back your thread up. These small groups, 10, 20, 30 people, and our elected officials don't care. Interest group resources, political action committees. We talked about political action committees in passing when I talked about political parties in elections. And they're having to think. I told you a couple of weeks ago that we would talk about this at a later date. That later date is now. So a political action committee, a PAC, they raise and give money in elections. Greater detail, a PAC, political action committee, a PAC is a type of political committee that is organized to spend money for the election or the defeat of a candidate. The PAC was created in 1944 
by the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO. What happened, what caused the creation of this PAC is Congress, pro-union, these labor union special interest groups were donating a lot of money directly to candidates. Congress as a whole was concerned that the union, they were buying these votes or they were electing the people they wanted. So they were concerned that organized labor would have too much power. They would have too much say over congressional decisions. So in 1944, they passed something called the Smith Connolly Act. All this does is ban direct union contributions to candidates. So the union can no longer give money directly to candidates. So these interest groups, organized labor, says, that's fine. We will play by these silly rules. And instead, they start to create political action committees. They create a middleman. We create a PAC, the union gives the money to the PAC because they, the union, cannot donate directly to the candidate. But then the PAC turns around and lo and behold, guess what the PAC can do? You got it, guys. The PAC can get, donate directly to the candidate. So all that did, the smith Connolly Act did, it didn't do what was intended. It didn't prevent these donations. It created a middleman. Organized labor gives their money to a PAC. PAC turns around and gives their money directly to the candidate. Well, organized labor is taking advantage of this. Business groups are a little behind. They don't realize what organized labor is doing with these PACs until the 1960s. During the 1960s, the 1970s, we start to see business groups create their own PACs to counter the strength of the union PACs, to counter the strength of these organized labor PACs. In the 1980s, members of Congress begin creating leadership PACs. The Speaker of the House, the House Majority Leader, the House Minority Leader, the Senate Majority Leader, the Senate Minority Leader, they start creating their own leadership packs, which they can use to donate money directly to people in their party who are running for re-election that they would like to see get re-elected. What else do you need to know about packs? They are limited in the amount of money they can raise they are limited in the amount of money they can donate. The most, the most money they can take from an individual donation is $5,000. The most money they can donate to a candidate is $5,000 per election cycle. So for our primary election, for our general election, these are two different election cycles they could donate up to $5,000 per candidate. The creation of a PAC. When a PAC, when a political action committee is created, it must register with the Federal Election Commissions. Commission. It must register with the Federal Elections Commission, the FEC. Which type of PAC gives the most money? We see that the business related PACs, trade and corporate PACs, this, this accounts for 64% of donations to elected officials. Citizen PACs, 28%. Labor, organized labor is now 7%. Agricultural does 1%. Friendly incumbent rule. Interest groups donate to those who can help, even if they are from the other party. 
the only packs that we have that are party Pacific, party specific, excuse me, are these leadership packs. The packs by the Republicans, the packs by the Democrats. Now, we may have some packs that their ideas align more closely with a particular party, with a particular ideology. But do these interest groups, do these PACs, do these interest groups care what the ideology is of, of the person, of the elected official? No, all they care is that they're going to help meet the goal. They're going to help advance the cause of the interest group. Interest groups do want to get people elected who are going to further their cause. Well, how do you have influence? By donating money. When it comes to interest groups, are they going to donate to the incumbent, the office holder, the opponent? Are they going to donate to both? Most of them are actually going to donate to both. We don't care about party affiliation. We don't care about ideology. All we care about is what we want, that perceived problem that we see. So if we have an incumbent Republican running for re-election, are we going to vote? Are we going to donate money? Say we have ten thousand dollars to ton, total to donate. Yeah, we. How much? We're going to we're going to donate to the Republican. How much? Probably around eight, maybe nine thousand. Well, what are we going to do with the additional? You know, oh, say say we do eight thousand. Well, what are we going to do with the additional two thousand that we didn't donate? We're going to turn around and donate it to that opponent, that Democrat. Why would we do that? Well, why are we going to put give so much money to the incumbent? We expect the incumbent to win. If the incumbent wins, we say, hey, we knew you could do it. We had faith in you. This is why we donated to your campaign. This is what we would like in return for our donation, in return for our continued support. This is the incumbent. They have this power. Well, why are we donating money to their opposition, to their opponent? Do incumbents always win? No. Sometimes they lose. If we give money to the challenger and the challenger happens to win, what can we say? Hey, I knew you could do it. I had faith that you could win this election. That is why I donated to your campaign. This is what I want in exchange for future donations. Now, do we bother to tell the winner that we donated to the loser? Please don't. That is going to be the worst thing you can do. But we are going to see, what I am trying to get across is that interest groups, these factions, as long as it's not a group by the political leaders, they really and truly don't care the ideology of the elected official. All they care about is that this elected official is going to help them meet their agenda, help them meet their goal. Super PACs. This was that, you know, 501 3C or whatever. This was the other thing I said we would talk about in a few weeks. The 527 groups. Super PACs. Super PACs are a relatively new addition to the political world. The super PACs are made possible by a decision, Supreme Court decision, Citizen United versus the Federal Election Commission. Citizen United versus the Federal Election Commission. This is a creation of the super PAC. What the court says 
is that if a PAC, a political action committee, does not make contributions to candidates, parties, or other PACs, they can become an independent expender on independent expenditure only committee, this first line, if they don't take money, or if they don't, excuse me, if they don't make contributions, if they don't give money to candidates, parties, or other PACs, they can raise unlimited sums of money. Remember I said that the PACs were limited. You could only, they could only take in a maximum amount of $5,000. Super PACs, they don't have this limit. If somebody wants to donate $100,000 to them, that's fine. They can. They can accept this donation. The PAC and the Super PAC. Let's do a comparison and contrast. Comparison, what do they have in common? They both have to register with the FEC, with the Federal Election Commission. Guys, that's the only commonality. That's the only thing they have in common. Differences. The PAC, they are limited in the amount of money that they can raise. Maximum of $5,000 donation the PAC can give directly to a candidate maximum of $5,000 per election cycle. Super PAC can raise unlimited sums. So that's the difference. Another difference, the Super PAC cannot give money directly to a candidate. Well, wait a second. If this super PAC can raise millions and millions of dollars for me, but can't give it to me, exactly what good are they? Why do we have them then? Well, even though the super PAC, look at this bottom line, cannot give directly to candidates, they can spend unlimited sums to campaign for or against political candidates. They cannot give money directly to you as a candidate, but they can purchase TV ad time, running commercials on your behalf. They can put commercials on the radio, telling people why they should vote for you, telling people why your opponent is horrible. They can run polls. They can support you in other ways other than directly donating money to you. Now, there is a catch, but there, for every, every catch, there is a workaround. The catch is, yes, the super PAC can spend money promoting your candidacy, sending out flyers on your behalf, buying TV time, buying radio time, but they cannot do this with a direct relationship with the candidate. The super PAC and the candidate cannot get together and create a plan. They cannot talk directly on how to spend this money. That is the rule. They cannot talk directly on how to spend this money. I said, there's a workaround. Say I'm running for president and I am giving a speech and there is a gentleman who's a president of a super PAC at my speech. During the course of my speech that I'm giving in front of 500 people, I look directly at this president of the super PAC and say, my poll numbers say that I am not doing well in the Pacific Northwest. I am lagging behind my opponent to increase my chances, to increase my poll numbers, to increase my popularity, it would be nice if somebody would start running television commercials, radio com commercials, to support my campaign, to run down, to smear my opponent. 
Now I'm saying this, and I'm saying this, I'm looking directly at the president of that super PAC. Oh, I'm saying this to the group, to the entire room of 500 people. But what do I expect? I expect the president of the super PAC to go to the Pacific Northwest, buy me airtime, buy me radio commercials, TV commercials, whatnot. Is this legal? Yes, it is, because the candidate was not talking directly, directly with the super PAC. This comment was made in a public forum. This, this comment was made in a room with 500 of the candidates' closest friends and family, right? Yeah. That is legal. So once again, commonalities, the PAC, the super PAC, must register with the Federal Election Commission. Differences. The PAC was created by the Smith Connolly Act. The Super PAC was a creation or was an offshoot of a Supreme Court decision, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. PAC can raise certain amounts of money, can don donate a maximum amount of money directly to a candidate. The Super PAC can donate or can run, excuse me, can raise unlimited amounts of money, but they cannot donate directly to a candidate. Interest groups, tactics, and lobbying. Last slide, and this is, this is fairly easy. Direct lobbying, this is an interest group tactic. Remember that this is targeted at policymakers. We're going to hire that lobbyist Lobbyist was the paid advocate for a group. Direct lobbying, these lobbyists are going to go speak directly to our elected representatives. Grassroots lobbying. This is the rank and file group members, the non-leadership positions. Remember I said that we wanted to have a large, politically active membership. Well, we need these rank and file group members to call their representatives, to call their U.S. House member, to call their states, or to call their U.S. senators, the two senators, to write letters. Let them know that this is what we want. If nobody says what, if nobody backs us, backs us up, if our rank and file group members don't get involved, we don't have any power. Information campaigns, bringing group views to the public's attention. Remember, I don't know. If I don't know, I don't care. It's not a problem unless I know about it. So by we want to educate the public, bring these problems to their attention. Last one, coalition building. Several organizations join together to lobby the representatives to lobby Congress, to lobby the president. Why would we join? Why would see, we see these two interest groups with the same interest, with the same goal, join together? Well, everybody has finite resources, time, money. By joining together, we at least extend. We have more, more money. We have more people, more voices, more power in numbers. So we, if they have the same group, the same goal, these groups will join together. Which one of these four tactics is going to have the shortest shelf life? Which one of these four tactics is going to last the least amount of time? Coalition building. Why? Think about it. You're always going to have lobbyists. You're always going to try to lobby your representatives to get what you want. You're always going to need your grassroots lobbying. You're going to have to bring information campaigns. But coalition building. Today, this is my goal. My goal is to save the koala. The American 
Federation for Koala. Well, I may join with the the interest group Koalas for America. We may join together. Well, once we get our legislation passed, once we get our policy passed, Congress does what we want, then what? Then we're going to have to move on to new goals. Then we're going to look for something else. Just because we get our first goal passed and these two interest groups settle on their next goal, does that mean these two goals are going to be compatible? Are they going to be the same? Not necessarily. We may have agreed on on topic A. We got it passed. We're good. Your topic B is not my topic B. And in fact, they're complete opposites. Our agenda, our coalition just fell apart. So the coalition building, this is going to have the shortest lifespan. 